Hey everyone, hope all is well. My name is Miles Dyer and welcome to the quest for global empathy. I just want to say, as I do every time, a huge thank you to everyone out there who has been supporting the show so far. We are so close to hitting our first target and once that is done, this show is completely grassroots funded. For me, that's a really important component of this show. When people tune in, all I want them to know is that the influence of what is discussed is between me and the guest, nothing else. And so it's really at the heart of this podcast and why I really need your support. So whether you've watched previous episodes or listened and like it, please visit patreon.com forward slash Miles Dyer and become a patron for as little as $1 a month. If you become a founding supporter for $10 a month, um, you get a limited edition of shirt. How about that? But if you haven't, seen one of these episodes before check this out and if by the end of it you're like i kind of like this then head on over there and uh, throw us your support or if you don't have any cash spare then just support us by liking the video sharing the podcast links you know all that sort of social media stuff so with all that said i am really excited with today's guest who is a spokesperson for the environmentalist group extinction rebellion his name is rupert reed rupert thanks for joining us pleasure I'm going to get straight into this mm. with uh, a big overview question, which is, I mean, you are a doctor. What is the diagnosis for planet Earth in 2019? Well, it's not looking great. No. <laughs> <laughs> the living planet is under unprecedented strain. We're sending species extinct at a rate of th- about a thousand times higher than the normal background rate. Uh, it's, it's hard to know how fast we're, st- we're sending species extinct because we don't know what most of the species on planet Earth are. In many ways, we're more biologically and ecologically ignorant than we are physically ignorant. We know more about the Andromeda galaxy than we do about the species in our own rainforest. But we're sending species extinct very, very fast, maybe at the rate of about one every 10 to 15 minutes. So by the time we finish this podcast, probably be about another five or six gone. Uh, it's, It's facts like that that really, I think, get to me and and get to a lot of people and and make us realize christ we've got to have a a massive massive reorientation the paradigm is completely wrong Mm. so yeah the situation is is grim in terms of biodiversity it's grim in terms of uh climate we'll talk about that i'm sure uh and really one of the main things that, that i try to do is get people to face up to this grimness uh, and people sometimes say to me, oh, Rupert, can't you be a bit more optimistic? We need a bit more hope. And I reply, look, there is no real genuine hope unless you're willing to face reality first and see where we actually are. It's a question of what we can hope for. And if what we're hoping for is just kind of bullshit fantasies, which are completely disconnected with where we actually are, that isn't really hope at all. That's just fooling yourself. I agree. I, I think that when it comes to this issue... Um, the ecological crisis is impacting our planet as a whole. So there are so many elements to that. And also the reasons for it happening is multifaceted as well. And so for the average person that is trying to engage with environmental issues as a, a label to really understand it and the seriousness, it actually requires us to sort of burst this bubble of, I mean, previous generations never had to worry about the consequence of um, mass industrialization. I mean, you know, we'll get into, you know, things like the market and that, but, you know, when capitalism, uh, you know, first sort of was up and coming, it was at a point where we weren't able to deplete resources at a faster rate as it was to replenish. And so actually it worked as a, as a good system there, but we are at a point now where um, I've mentioned it on previous episodes, they've got, um, I can't remember what the term is, but, um, I think every year that the date is coming forward, I think it's August every year, at which point yeah. the planet has used all its resources for that year. Um, and so we do need a shake up that way. So, yeah. So just to just to follow up on one or two of the details, of what you just said there, there, Miles, you're basically right. But it is also true that there are precedents of a kind. Right. There are many societies that have run into ecological limits before. And basically, when that happens, they either adapt or they die. And quite often they die. Quite often they collapse. Uh, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, is a great one for people to read if they want to understand more about that. There are any examples of societies in the past that have run into ecological limits and game over. 
Other societies have managed to adapt. So a very interesting case to think about is some of the world's surviving indigenous societies. Now, many of those indigenous societies had a huge negative impact on their environments at some point in their history. So a fascinating example is in Australia, the Aboriginal peoples in Australia, right? They, they basically trashed Australia when they arrived 60 to 80,000 years ago. They exterminated most of the megafauna to some extent accidentally, uh, to some extent deliberately through, through hunting and enormous impacts on their, on their landscape. And now they are a very well adapted people to their landscape, unlike industrial civilization Australia, which is destroying Australia at an extraordinary rate. And Australia is going to be probably one of the first continents to collapse if collapse is what is going to happen. Um, but so there seems to be a paradox there. On the one hand, the Aboriginal peoples, and there are many other cases like this also across the Americas, for example, and indeed in Europe, they destroyed their megafauna, they damaged their environment severely. And on the other hand, we now know indigenous peoples as peoples who live in great harmony with their environment. Well, how do you square these two? And the answer, of course, is they learned. They managed to survive, and they realized the only way to survive is to live in a more harmonious relation with their environment. Now, that's exactly what we need to do. The problem in our case, right, is that we've now got this globalized industrial civilization, which is rupturing the limits to growth, rupturing the planetary limits and we need to learn the lesson before we collapse because if we collapse it's going to be pretty terminal it will be across the planet and we've got so many people now we're going to be talking if we do collapse we're going to be talking about not just millions but probably billions of, uh, of human death let alone the deaths to to all the other species so we've got to learn from these people who live harmoniously with their environments we've got to learn what they learned through painful experience and we've got to learn it before our experience gets quite as painful as theirs otherwise it will be too late the, the thing that humans have arguably over other species is foresight through yeah. imagination we can look into the future mm. um, and yet we do sort of run on this old brain mentality of just reacting um, and so with previous crises um, I mean there's a lot of talk at the moment with things like the Green New Deal is we need this bold um, proposition that is as brave if not braver or more ambitious than during the you know World War Two of just yeah. remobilizing our infrastructure Absolutely. to take on this threat yeah we need but, a wartime mobilization right but that was in the face of a perceived threat. You could see it. You yeah. could see it happening. Whereas, yeah. and going back to my point about foresight, um, although we're s starting to see, you know, changes in the world and um, it's, you know, frog in boiling water for many people, if we wait until it's so bad mm. that we go, damn, it's happening. It's, yeah. it is, well, it's, it's, it's arguably too late now, isn't it? Well, look, let's take that one step at a time. Sorry, yeah, firstly, there's going to be a lot of overlaps <laughs> of issues in this conversation. Uh, firstly, uh, on the frog in boiling water, that's a really important one to get straight on. Um, the question is, can we be as intelligent as frogs? Because, you know, the truth about frogs is very different from the, the legend, right? The truth is, if you put frogs... In, and, you know, I, hope oh, I, know, I know the metaphor is actually not yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you, I hope no one's going to do this. No <laughs> listener's going to do this. But if you put a, a frog in water and you gradually heat it up, most frogs will actually jump out before it gets to the yes. boiling point. So the question is, can we be as smart as frogs? Can we show as much foresight as frogs? Now, one would really hope <laughs> that human beings are able to be at least as bright as, as frogs, right? But we can't jump out the planet. That's the only oh, no, issue. No, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> but what we can do is, is have foresight, right, and see yeah. what's coming. For, for me, this is tied up crucially with the concept of precaution, of being precautious, of not being reckless, um, of not doing damage that is foreseeable, which exposes us to very, very grave risks, for example, the risk of, uh, of collapse. Uh, and this is summarized uh, in philosophy and in international law through the idea of the precautionary principle. And what the precautionary principle says, basically, is... If you're doing something which is potentially very, very risky, then you don't need to wait until all the evidence is in to decide to stop carrying on doing it. You should stop carrying on doing it ahead of that because by the time you wait for all the evidence, it could well be too late, right? So that's foresight. That would be foresight. Surely we, we know all these principles. We understand all of this. We just have to learn how to apply it. Now, you ask, but isn't it too late? Haven't we already failed this test? I think with the question of is it, is it too late, we've got to always ask ourselves, too late for what, right? So it's too late to avoid the 
sixth mass extinction of other species. That's ongoing. It's not too late, however, to stop that mass extinction becoming as catastrophic as some of the previous uh, mass extinctions. For example, the late Permian mass extinction, where 96% of, uh, of species on Earth were um, rendered extinct. Um, so it's too late for one thing, but not too late for the other. It's too late to avoid dangerous anthropogenic climate change. Uh, it's too late to avoid the kind of climate chaos we're already seeing in the last few years, which, of course, is one of the main reasons why so many people are now, thank God, finally waking up. It's not too late to stop that climate chaos from spinning away into runaway climate change, for example, where we escalate through three, four, five, six, seven degrees uh, of overheat. Uh, it's too late, and here's a, a slightly controversial claim, but I think only very slightly. I think it's actually very, very clear if you're willing to open your, your eyes. It's too late to save industrial civilization and progress in the form that we understand that term uh, as usual. We're too far down the road now. We have to do put too drastic a handbrake emergency turn on to our, to our system to be able to carry on. But it's not too late, in my opinion, in my belief, for us to be able to head off collapse. It's going to be incredibly hard for us to stop a collapse from occurring. But I don't think it's, well, let's put it this way. I don't think the evidence is in that it's too late for that. I think for all that we know, we might still just be able to do it. It is going to take an enormous, unprecedented change. It's going to be like a wartime mobilization. And this time, as you say, in a way, the enemy is one that we cannot see. But in another way, we are starting to see the enemy quite clearly. And I'm not just referring to uh, Trump and Bolsonaro and, and Johnson and, and so on. I'm referring to the way that our weather is spinning out of control. I'm referring to the way you can see now the destruction in the Amazon and in the central uh, African forests and so on. So we are at a, a really horrendous moment in our history, but also a moment where I believe that there is Genuine, genuine hope, because there are various things that it is not too late for. But we have to be honest about the things that it is too late for. We have to be ready to give those up. We have to be ready to relinquish them. And among the things that's going to be very challenging for us to relinquish, we have to relinquish the fantasy, for example, that we can carry on growing uh, our economy uh, and still be able to survive and avoid collapse. There is no choice there. We are definitely going to have to make do in the future with an economy which is going to be more of, let's put, it, let's put it this way, of a manageable dimension, more compatible with planetary limits. The only question is, are we going to make that kind of choice voluntarily or are we going to have it forced upon us? And I really hope and urge that it would make complete sense for us to try to make it voluntarily. If it's forced upon us, it's going to be very, very ugly and millions or more likely billions will die. And, and forced isn't just necessarily because of the changing environment um, and natural law imposing, you know, just how much carbon's in the atmosphere. So this is now the environment that we live in, but it's also governments leaving it, kicking the cans so far down the road yeah. that they go, we have to act. We now need to we, we, it's not about transitioning anymore. It's about martial law. And, and you know, th that, that, those are the things I, 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 I do really worry about. And yeah. um, when I hear politicians talk about the cost of a Green New Deal, you know, X trillion yeah. you know, dollars that it will cost, mm. they never benchmark that against how many trillions it will cost to not do it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And this what they don't... Phil Philip Hammond said uh, recently, didn't he, that, that the cost of making the, these kind of changes... Uh, he he reckoned it in a trillion or trillions. Um, and it's just extraordinary when a politician like that doesn't take into account, as you say, the fantastically vast a cost, which cannot be measured in money, although money is part of it, of not taking the kind of massive, precautious, remedial action that we now need to take. The cost in terms of lives, human lives and other lives, is going to be greater than anything we know. People don't like comparisons with, uh, with the Second World War, specifically with the, the Holocaust. They sometimes say it's offensive or something like that. But look, the, the facts are facts. Uh, in the Second World War, you had um, uh, about um, 8 million people killed in the Holocaust. You had in total about 25 million people killed in that conflict. We are talking about the very real possibility of not just tens of millions, not just hundreds of millions, but billions of human beings, let alone other uh, creatures, dying within a generation, perhaps, 
right? Within, in other words, the lifetime of most people listening to this, if we do not get this right. You do not have to trust me on that. Various uh, brave uh, climate scientists, for example, have started to say that those are the stakes, stakes now. People like uh, Will Steffen, people like uh, Schnell uh, Hauber, uh, people like Wolfgang Knorr, uh, are are coming clean and saying we are looking at the we are staring the breakdown of our civilization uh, in the face. We need to sort this out very very quickly, or the costs will be incalculably greater than the kind of things that people like Philip Hammond and other narrow minded politicians have been saying so far. Um, to bring it back, and when we talk about collapse, could you just break down for people like? what you mean by collapse because yeah. it's not just in terms of society it is about the ecology and everything in between yeah yeah so when i talk about collapse i'm talking about the uneven ending of our ordinary ways of uh making sense uh of living and of being able to live so at, in its most basic terms uh, i'm talking about um uh, our economy and our society uh, no longer being able to function in anything like the way they do uh, such that it's very, very difficult for people to continue to live. Uh, the most likely uh, scenario for collapse uh, is probably uh, one of uh, drastic food shortages. There are other possibilities, though, it, and it might be a combination, of course. You know, it could be, could be to do with war, could be to do with uh, epidemic, could be to do with uh, water shortages, or water and food are integrally uh, related. Um, but the number of people that we have on our planet now and the number of people that we have in a small uh, country like this uh, in England, uh, especially, um, they are th those people are relying on the continuation of systems which are not going to be able to continue. And that is why we have to drastically prioritize a transition away from uh, those systems. We need to do things like get more people back onto the land. We need to look at uh, uh, permaculture and uh, organic solutions. Uh, we need to look at ways of, uh, of harvesting water and, and keeping water because we may well uh, in the coming years have droughts that put to shame the drought that we had last summer, which really put our food supply in this country on the edge. Uh, crops uh, where I live in East Anglia, for example, were down 35 to 40 percent. We think we're going to be able to buy in food from abroad. We if we talk, if we look at the possible scenarios for what's coming, with possible what they call multi bread basket failures, you cannot guarantee that guarantee that any longer. You cannot guarantee that you're going to be able to carry on importing food from countries which are going to be struggling. Uh, already to feed themselves yeah yeah already. struggling already but we could be struggling a lot more to feed them feed themselves in a impossible drought future scenarios so you know to put it in in extremely crude and simple terms um collapse involves um, a society no longer being able to uh, sustain itself and being able to sustain uh, uh its people uh, and the, the most obvious but not the only possible vector for that um, is uh, insufficient uh, food supplies. And, you know, you really, really don't want to go down that path. And again, uh, I guess another step back in terms of what is driving collapse. I mean, we people hear climate change yeah. and, you know, um, see the Amazon and mm. stories like that. Mm. Could you give an overview of what are the factors that are causing these changes and yeah. what are the risks that we are currently seeing unfold because of human civilization? Yeah. So um, climate has been getting a lot of airtime recently, thank God, finally. And it is absolutely crucial. It is the probably the most likely uh, way in which um, collapse will uh, occur due to global overheat and due to weather chaos, which is uh, climate chaos. Um, however, it's important to understand that uh, that climate is only one of the dramatic novel crises to which we are exposed. We've already mentioned another one of them, which is the biodiversity crisis. And it is not correct to think that climate change, dangerous anthropogenic climate breakdown, is the main cause of biodiversity loss. It's not. It's a contributing cause and an important contributing cause and an increasingly important contributing cause but the main contributing cause is loss of habitat the main contributing cause is destruction of natural ecosystems and we urgently need to preserve natural ecosystems for a whole host of reasons but one of the absolutely essential reasons why is if we do not then we are increasing um uh, rapidifying the uh, the sixth extinction crisis and that is appalling because we are getting rid of beings before we even know that they exist and we're getting rid of beautiful fellow beings that accompany us uh, on this earth 
We're getting rid of beings in some cases who I would make the controversial claim really have something to teach us and in some ways might even be thought of as being better than us. Uh, why do I say that? Look at bonobo chimpanzees, the incredible, beautiful, loving way in which they live our lives and form their communities and heal rifts and contrast that not only with chimpanzees, but with human beings and the way that human beings often settle uh, their disputes. Or look at some of the extraordinary cultural beauty and altruism and so forth of, uh, of the social whales and dolphins, and there's so much that we could learn from them. All of those creatures are at risk. And, of course, the extinction crisis ultimately threatens us um, because it's about us losing um, um, all of the uh, resources of places like uh, rainforest in terms of potential cures for diseases and in terms of nutrients and so many, uh, so many other things. So uh, the uh, uh, extinction crisis, the biodiversity crisis interacts with the climate crisis, but it's not the same thing. Um, and we should be just as concerned by what's going on in the Amazon and what's going on in Africa right now with these fires. We should be just as concerned about it in terms of the, the, uh, the species that are being exterminated as we should be concerned about it in terms of the climatic uh, uh, effects of it. So those are the two most prominent aspects of our multifactorial crisis. Of course, those are in many ways and, and should be understood as, must be understood as mainly effects rather than causes, right? So let, we have to look deeper. So why are these things happening, right? Why does the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, why do the numbers of those gases, why does the amount of carbon in the atmosphere go up every year? Why are so many species going extinct? Uh, and that has to do with a number of things. It has to do with human industrialization. Uh, it has to do with our completely dysfunctional economic model. It has to do with huge inequality and the, and the profligacy of the, of the rich and of large uh, corporations and the, uh, and the rapacious greed that is often exhibited there, um, which is out of control. Um, and it has to do also with sheer human numbers. Um, I'm not one of those people who say, yes, overpopulation is the, the cause of the problem. Um, but it would be foolish to say that um, overpopulation had nothing to do uh, with the problem. Because um, it, it, it corresponds with the lifestyle. Um, I, I remember ages ago hearing about if the, everyone in China lived the same lifestyle as Americans, like in terms of everyone owning a car, yeah. there's actually not enough raw material in the ground for that to happen. Yeah. So like natural law alone states that it's it, it is to do with population but it's in accordance with lifestyle and yeah. so if you live a more efficient uh lifestyle then it won't it, it mitigates that exactly so so the the key variable in many ways as you've just said uh is levels of consumption um uh, level of uh, affluence um um the uh, amount of impact per person uh, so the amount of impact per person uh, is way higher um, in this country than it is in, say, most of uh, Africa. Um, so uh, increasing the population here uh, in England is uh, significantly worse than increasing the population in, uh, in Africa. But at the end of the day, increasing the population anywhere puts additional strain on resources. And at the end of the, de end of the day, everything if you will, can be seen as a kind of numbers game. Um, if uh, people in China um, were living uh, relatively uh, frugally, um, that would be uh, great compared to them not doing so. But if there were, if, imagine you tried to have like 3 billion people in China, uh, that would still be putting uh, intolerable strain on the resources, not only of China, but of the, of the whole planet. So bottom line is that um, human population is a factor, a variable, which we cannot uh, ignore. The, the mistake that is commonly made is to think that it is the variable uh, and the preeminent uh, factor. But it's also a mistake to say it's irrelevant. People who say, oh, we could have 20 billion people on this planet, we could have 200 billion people on this planet, you know, th these, are, these are absurd dreams and, and fantasies. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, at the end of the millennium, um, the more you increase the human population, the more strain you're putting on uh, the planet or the local place where those people are. So these are all these are all relevant factors. But I think it's clear that the that the the thing which has changed uh, uh, the most and which has enabled the human population to rise as much as it has uh, has been uh, the process of industrialization and in particular uh, the industrialization of of, uh, of agriculture. Um, and these are things that 
have to change. And again, here my my own message is fairly bold and uncompromising. Um, we can hope as we go forward to hold on to some elements of what we've learned uh, over the past 200, 250 years in terms of um, uh, in terms of industrialism. And I hope, for example, that the future has in it um, uh, some um, um, excellent and improving long distance um, communications and information technology so that we can continue learning with each other across the world and staying in touch with each other uh, and um, and not becoming uh, strangers to each other and so on and so forth. But there is going to have to be a huge retrenchment. The idea that we can endlessly grow, uh, the idea that we can endlessly keep on expanding um, uh, our industrial base, the idea that that so-called development can be endlessly exported, that everyone, as you said, everyone, the idea that everyone in China or everyone in, in India and so on can live as we are living in Britain right now, these are for the birds. So what's the implication of that? Well, the implication of that, of course, is that to avoid a ridiculous, unfair situation where we in England say, well, we're going to keep our gains, thank you very much, but you need to stop developing. Uh, what we need to do in countries like this is to take leadership by actually rolling things back and showing how we can uh, live off less uh, and showing how... Um, uh, start the, the areas, the, the massive elements of, of so-called industrial progress which have been damaging, showing how those can, those can be put into reverse um, and how if we, for example, um, expand the amount of genuine renewable uh, energy technologies that we have, that means getting rid of fossil fuels and getting rid of them very, very fast. And that means that we're going to have to have a future in which overall uh, we live off uh, less energy. Now, some people, when they hear that, uh, they think, oh, well, this sounds really grim, right? I was told that things were always going to be getting, we were always going to be getting richer, progress was going to go on forever and so on. You're saying that's going to end. And, and my response to that is twofold. I'm saying, yes, the reality is that is going to end. And the only choice, as I said earlier, is whether you end it voluntarily or whether you have an end drastically forced upon you by collapse. But the mistaken assumption is to think that our lives are going to get worse if we don't go on so-called progressing forever. Because my claim is that there is a beautiful coincidence between the very things that we need to do to start living within our means and to have a, an ecologically sane future and the very things that we need to do in order to improve our lives and improve our well-being. Because the truth is actually that, and I know you've talked on this about this on some of your previous podcasts, the truth is that actually many people in a society like this one are living reasonably long lives, but actually quite miserable lives. There's a huge epidemic of loneliness. There's an epidemic of mental ill health. People find their lives um, in many ways deeply unsatisfying uh, and lacking um, in purpose. We've got all this stuff, but is it really making us happy? And what I think we can learn so clearly from the great wisdom traditions, from the great um, philosophers, uh, and from leaders like, uh, like Gandhi, for example, in recent times, what I think is so clear is that there are ways of living that are lower in their ecological impact and higher in their propensity for people to actually have good, satisfying, interconnected lives. And this is what I call the beautiful coincidence. And this beautiful coincidence is what might still make it possible for us to save ourselves. This is actually a nice segue into getting into the organisation um, Extinction Rebellion, which we'll talk about more in detail shortly. Um, but when we talk about politics and we, we look at initiatives like the Green New Deal, it touches upon exactly what you've just mentioned there, which is, I think, the framing of the argument for transitioning to a better system has... I, I don't think the, the the framing has been perfected because mm. it has often been spoken about these are the things we have to give up. And you're right, there are things that we would have to give yeah. up. But actually, and I'm starting to see it happen with certain people in the US, you've got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Bernie Sanders, um, a lot of progressive um, activists in the US, and it's, it's starting to happen over here, where they're actually saying, no, to deal with climate change and to democratise our system, it actually improves our lives because um the green technology and you know transforming our energy systems away from fossil fuel to renewable energy creates jobs mm -hmm. um when i talk with people that are ideologically different to me i mean it's I, I don't even know where i put myself i think on the quadrants i'm sort of libertarian left but i'd even have disagreements with that mm. but when i talk with my libertarian friends who um might have issues with government intervention with this 
I've always spoken about how renewable energy is a way of decentralizing the power structure. If everyone has uh, solar power panels on their home, you're now off the grid. Yeah. Um, if there is a, a power cut at a power station, you're now able to feed off your neighbours. Um, I think that will change the job market because the reason many of us work jobs is we are on an oil-based economy. That's what it all goes back to. Yeah. If you're producing your own energy, um, that actually gives you independence. Um, it can... Uh, feed into things like 3D printers, which is a manufacturing tool which takes cars and um, uh, trucks off the road. Uh, I mean, already as we talk about any of these things, you can go in any direction with mm. these uh, issues. But um, I, I was just curious to hear your thoughts. Um, and again, we'll go more into Extinction Rebellion specifically um, in, a, in a moment. But when it comes to winning the argument and winning over the hearts and minds of the general public about mm what a serious issue this is and mm. the massive change that we need to make. What are your thoughts on making a positive argument and and not being so much about we have to give up these things, but more like actually we can live a more efficient lifestyle, but not yeah. in a way that lessens what it is to be alive? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think on the one hand, as you say, we have to be honest. There are things that are going to have to be given up. We're going to have to uh, give up, for example, the aspirations of some of us to have uh, constant flights all over the world. That is just not possible. Uh, George Monbiot is very good and clear on, on this on, in his book, Heat, for example. Um, there are things we're going to have to give up. The question Could, is... Just, just does, on that quickly, sorry. Yeah. If, if, if people at the moment were to fly once a year each, obviously that's possibly not far enough, but that would make a significant difference. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you know offhand the stats of like, the average person, how often they fly. Are they, I don't know if there are stats at hand or... Well, it's very interesting you, you say that because, of course, the average person, if you're talking about the whole world, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. doesn't fly no, at no, all. No. <laughs> 80% of people, in fact, some estimates say it's much higher than that, have never flown. Um, so uh, we need to remember that in this country, we're already in a sort of very privileged bubble there. Uh, within a country like this one also, flying is still very much uh, the preserve of uh, the well-off um, and elites, including uh, business uh, elites. 15% um, of the people take 70% of the flights in this country. So 85% of the people in this country fly rarely or not at all. Of course you're right. If people, If everyone just flew less or if everyone flew the same small amount in a country like this one, uh, that would improve things. If everyone around the whole world flew a small amount, we'd still be stuffed, right? So f air travel is not the, the future. Unless, you know, we can cons we can imagine that it might be conceivable a long time in the future for us to have, you know, airships conceivably, although it looks like they'd have to go very slowly. We might be able to have solar-powered uh, planes in the future, although it looks like there won't be jumbo jets. And those are not imminent if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, we'll just wait for the, the te technology will transition. It's not going to be like that, right? What we must do is rein in flying now if we're serious about having a future. One of the no-brainers there is no air Airport expansion is an absolute kind of basic kind of first base. If we expand Heathrow Airport, we are saying, we are stating very clearly, we do not care about the future. Children, stuff you. You know, you, you can be collapsed as far as we, can, we are concerned. You can just die. Uh, that, that's, that's what expanding Heathrow uh, is saying. So look, to, to cut back out to a more general picture, there are things we're going to have to give up. But it's a terrible mistake to say to focus, as you say, to first to focus our messaging around that. And that, of course, is what the enemies of uh, ecology are always trying to do. They're always trying to say, oh, you just want people to give everything up and you want everyone to have miserable lives, etc. My point, of course, is they're not going to be miserable lives. In fact, they could be better lives. There's a lot of misery right now and there's a, there's a lot of horrible insecurity right now. Uh, insecurity of all sorts, but a growing level of, of insecurity around climate, insecurity around, in, around ecology. In fact, you think we've got a mental health crisis at the moment, you know, it's going to get miles worse over the next five to ten years as more and more people wake up to just how desperate the situation is. But you know what? That mental health crisis could just be the making of us because that's what we need. We need people to be getting depressed scared, desperate, right? That's the process that someone like me has been through. That's the process, process that everyone pretty much in the Green Party, my party, has been through, and, and certainly pretty much everyone who I know in Extinction Rebellion, 
right? They've been through that process of facing the horror of what we've been doing and of what's coming and of then that changing their lives and, and, and their priorities. So there's a, there's a coming terrible mental health crisis and it could be tragically but wonderfully exactly what we need in order to wake us up to get us to, to, to face what's coming and to face ourselves and to change uh, what's coming. But as I was saying a few minutes ago, the, the, the even better news um, is that as we start to change, as we start to make our society compatible with planetary limits, and where some of us are starting to do that, we can improve our lives. It improves people's lives to do more exercise. It improves people's lives, lives uh, to, um, to know more people, to be part of a more embedded community. It improves people's lives to have better roots, right? We've become awfully kind of disembedded and flitting around from one place to another and not knowing our neighbors and so on and so forth. None of this is good for mental well-being. None of this is good for life satisfaction. So once again, I think this phrase, the beautiful coincidence, could be a useful and important one that that the very things that we need to do to improve our lives largely coincide with the very things we need to do in order to save ourselves. And these fantasies of, oh, you'll be made happier by having more and more and more products or just go on more and more and more flights and then you'll be uh, a, a person who is fully fulfilled. That, that's just what the, what the producers are, are teaching us. That's what the advertisers want us to believe. It doesn't actually make us happy. Um, on a personal note, I, I do remember about a decade ago when I first really became aware of these issues and I remember having mild panic attacks at night. I, yeah. Just visions of like oil refineries and just mm. very surreal yeah. visions because it was just when you became aware of, as we speak right now, us ripping up the earth uh, for all that it's yeah. worth and yeah. um, it, it was a very overwhelming thing. And I think that that is where despair can be quite destructive in activism which is where we present with people what the problems are and the reason people bat them away is i don't know what to do about it what you know i always say when i present issues to people in my videos and things like that it's in the context of what you can do about it um i, I mentioned it before in the sense of um entertain inform inspire so entertain is you grab people's attention mm -hmm. because there's a lot of noise out there you've got to cut through that um inform you want people to leave what you've said with more information than what they came to the conversational video with or piece mm. of media with in the first place. But the last thing is probably the most important, which is inspire. It's about giving people autonomy to own it themselves and to go out into the world and realize they don't need to wait for someone else. Yeah. Although there are people that will say I'm waiting for direction, but I think if you just present the problems, um, that's when people do act in despair and actually probably switch off. Yeah, look, I'm kind of with you, but let me give a slightly different angle. Oh, on I'm looking at this. <laughs> uh, so, inspire, absolutely, but inspire, of course, also means breathe, means take a take a breath. It does yeah? And I think that that's crucial too. One of the things I do when I give my Extinction Rebellion talks is I say to people towards the end, "So, look, I've been showing you this desperate problem." I've been outlining to you this desperate and wonderful solution that we're offering. Maybe we'll talk more about that yeah. soon. But what I also want you to do before you rush off into that solution is pause for a minute, is take a breath, uh, slow down and sit with it for a while. Because I actually think that it's really important that we sit with the horrible stuff for a while and that we don't rush too quickly for, oh, what's the solution? Because if we don't sit yeah. with it, then we don't really fully feel with it. And, you know, even despair can be good for a while. Despair can be good because it it's impressing us it's impressing upon us the real depth of the of the tragedy and of the of the disaster and of the of the appallingness. We need to face reality. We need to be far more honest than we've been uh, for a long time about how deep our plight is and how deep the solutions need to be. Right. One of the dangers if you don't allow yourself to sit in despair or even depression for a, a while, as as I've done and many of the people who I know have done, is that you you rush for solutions which are not deep enough solutions. They can be false solutions. And Quick when you fixes. really yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. when you really get how deep the problem is, when you really get how much needs to change, that's when you're in a good position to actually start to move determinedly, determinedly towards the genuine solution. So I want to put in a, a little word for um, for pausing 
uh, and even a little word for despair. <laughs> but look, you're right. What what we don't what you don't want to do is just leave people stuck in depression and despair, especially isolated, without any sense of what the solutions are. That's one of the reasons why community is so important here, and one of the reasons why, if for example, someone listening to this podcast is feeling a bit kind of overwhelmed uh, or a bit like, oh my god, this is too much information, and I don't know what to do with it, and I don't know what the solutions are. Well, one of the first steps is talk about it with other people, right? Realize that you are not alone. And that's one of the great things that's been happening in the last few years. In my think tank, Greenhouse, we started to contemplate this stuff. And we all felt terribly alone. We all felt, God, I'm terrified about the future of the world. And I think it's just me who's this terrified. And then we, sh we shared our fears with each other. And then we felt less alone. Right? And then we could start to act on the problems. And again, it's the same in Extinction Rebellion. One of the important things that Extinction Rebellion has done, I think, is provided people with opportunities of all sorts for sharing their fears and sharing their hopes and sharing their intentions for action. So, yeah, I would say to anyone who's feeling at all isolated or overwhelmed, don't stay isolated. Share your concerns, share your fears. You'll find that you probably actually do share them with a lot of people. And that's one of the crucial grounds on which you can build community and build solutions. I agree. And I can attest to that because of what happened after that. Although I did have moments of isolation and despair, I did start speaking about it. And that's how you make connections. Yeah. And I agree with having the brief element in there. Mm. Um, there was a phrase I came up with a while ago, which was saying along the lines of... Um, the truth sometimes hurts, but I like to regard it as growing pains. This mm -hmm. idea yeah, that it is yeah, a, yeah. It's a process that, that can help you. Um, going back to when we were talking about flights and sort of individual actions, um, there was a, a report I saw not too long ago about that uh, about 70 percent of the world's emissions are caused by 100 uh, companies. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at, you know, what is the individual acts people can take to help and and i'm not con you know dismissing them i think everyone does need to do their part yeah but there is this big machine you know the yeah. industry and yeah. there are you know we, we can look at um agriculture and the, the meat industry yeah i'm um, sort of just as a disclaimer to you and uh, my, my listeners will know um i'm not a vegan uh but i eat a lot of vegan products and i'm a lot better than i used to be and mm. I, you know i don't apologize for that i want to get better and i will do and actually the solutions of I mean, KFC, I think, last week did um, in Atlanta in America. Um, it, I think it was called Beyond KFC. And I think it was just one shop. It was just all vegan uh, product and they mm. sold out. Mm. Uh, and now they're reviewing it to look at these transitions. And I think yeah. Burger King's doing the Impossible Burger. And, you know, there is a, a market appetite for that because I think when people are given the choice, um, I hate using this phrase when talking about veganism, it's kind of the chicken or egg of, um, <laughs> uh, you know, people want to be vegan, but it's too expensive. But as people yeah. try more, more is produced. There's better choice. All the supermarkets now have great vegan, even cheaper places like in the UK have Aldi. And um, I've been able to get lots of great vegan substitutes. And I, I think that's going to keep snowballing. Mm. But, yeah. but uh, I digress. Um, when it comes to like these hundred companies that are responsible for 70% of the emissions, how do we take that on? Yeah, this is such an important question. So let me try a few different angles on it. So firstly, in terms of you mentioned the, the flying angle, I think the uh, Green Party policy on this has a lot to be said for it, which is the idea of a frequent flyer levy. So the idea there is that in a country like this one, if somebody takes their first flight in a year, that would have a relatively low um, tax on it. The second flight would have a, a much higher tax. Right. The third flight would have an astronomically higher uh, tax and it would ratchet up really really steeply thus discouraging people from taking more than one or maybe two flights in a year so that's the kind that's of thing amazing. i've not, not not heard of that yeah that's it's quite a, a it's quite a smart policy yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not it's not perfect it's not a silver bullet nothing is right but it would take us in it in a way better direction than the, the situation we're in uh, at the moment and especially it would mean that it would massively disincentivize for example uh, businesses to businesses to set to to send their business people on endless flights to conferences or whatever, or to allow their business people to commute to work. I mean, some people commute to work by air, you know, completely insane. Um, it, it would mean that that just stopped. Um, but now to generalize the picture, yeah, um, the, the stats roughly uh, right. A, a relatively small number of companies are responsible for a huge amount of the climate damaging emissions. Of course, we also need to remember, though, that those companies are 
typically selling products to us, right? So this doesn't get us off the hook completely. Um, and what does that imply? Well, what it implies to me is that when Extinction Rebellion says, look, what this is really about is system change, that's true. And systems are, of course, also composed of individuals. And what that really means is that it's a kind of, it's a kind of end to the blame game, right? So yeah, sure, there are some companies that behave a lot better than others and they should be praised and they should be supported and they should be patronized. Uh, there are some companies that behave really badly and they should be criticized and they should be, uh, laws should be made that make what they do more difficult, right? Uh, um, and, uh, and there are some politicians that are doing good stuff and there are some politicians that are doing horrendous stuff, like at the moment uh, Bolsonaro and Trump are, are the absolute worst. But they're so bad, though, that that shouldn't let us let the rest off the hook because pretty much anyone in politics as usual, pretty much anyone in government is, is uh, part of a toxic system that is doing terrible damage that has to change. So what we say in Extinction Rebellion is at the end of the day, while we make these kinds of distinctions and we, we need to make these kinds of distinctions, at the end of the day, there is a very real sense in which we are all in this together. And what we need to do is change our systems such that we are no longer destroying stuff in this way and that we don't have these companies that are causing this tremendous damage and that many of us are the are the customers of. So this is going to mean absolutely dramatic changes, you know, beginning with telling the truth about how bad things are. That's Extinction Rebellion's first demand. Um, moving to stop um, the carbon emissions that are destroying our future, moving to stop biodiversity rapidly. That's our second demand. That's the actions that we most desperately need. And then the third demand of Extinction Rebellion, a citizens' assembly to decide how to get from here to there. The citizens in a kind of a super jury of uh, several hundred of us who are representative of all of us, um, deciding how we're going to do this. And the decisions that are going to be made by this citizens' assembly, if we get that far, as I pray that we will, um, the decisions that are going to be made are going to have enormous impacts on our economic and financial system. They may mean that many companies uh, close down. They, they will certainly mean that, that all companies have to change their ways uh, radically, some more than others. They may well mean uh, an end to capitalism uh, as we know it. That's, you know, not to, that would be for the Citizens' Assembly to, dis to decide. Is some reformed form of capitalism compatible with living within planetary limits or, or not? You know, that's a matter which uh, experts can advise on and that we believe that citizens will ultimately make a good, uh, a good decision on. But you see what I'm, what I'm getting at here. At the end of the day, it's much less helpful to say, oh, Trump and Bolsonaro are so terrible, or look at the disgusting things that are being done by Cargill um, or um, Rio Tinto Zinc or um, uh, Barclays or whatever, or Burger King. Yeah, uh, Burger King has a lot of responsibility for what's going on in the Amazon right now. Uh, destruction of uh, forest in order to pr free up land for, for ranching. All of those things are true. Um, but at the end of the day, they are less important than us saying, let's get together, let's agree that we're in a situation where everything needs to change and we all need to change it and we all need to be responsible in all aspects of our life for that change. And let's try to see if we can move forward together. At the end of the day, recriminations are only going to get us so far. And if there's going to be a future for humanity, it's going to involve uh, more empathy and more forgiveness and, uh, frankly, more love. Um, uh, and only if we're able to, to, to access that and get beyond uh, our tendencies towards uh, uh, anger and recrimination and violence, only if we're able to do that are we going to actually make it. The, the citizens assembly idea I, th I find really interesting and I hadn't I think from you it was the first time I'd heard of it and then I know Rory Stewart running for the um, conservative uh, leadership was also talking about it then um, uh, regarding Brexit um, and it the, the sort of democratization of bringing the public in it kind of reminds me indirectly of I, I think it's in Germany that they have I assume it's a law where any board of a company has to 50% has to be made up of workers so that when decisions are made at the boardroom level, yeah. it's just not shareholders. It's also the people that are doing the work mm. and it just keeps everyone in check and with empathy, you know, not just in terms of um, what are, it, other reasons people may think just having people there it humanizes every aspect of the company. And I think it just makes everyone better. Mm. Um, but the other thing that came to mind also was um, during Occupy Wall Street in 2011, 
there was an app that was created by an activist and I assume it just didn't take off at the time but someone had designed an app where on your phone you could scan the barcode of any item at a shop and it would tell you the hierarchy of what companies owned it mm, yeah. so that you could then start voting mm. with your wallet and funnily mm. enough actually I saw an article just three weeks ago I think um, a new version has come out and so with things mm. like that people really yeah. do want to um, vote with their wallet and I think that using the market forces that can actually um, help us move in. I, I totally agree. Like I say, we have to do everything, right? We have to use our power as voters. We have to use our power as uh, so-called uh, consumers. We have to use our power as workers. That's very important, right? Um, there are calls um, in for uh, a climate strike of adults going on strike in September, September the 20th. I'd urge any listeners who are convinced by the kinds of things we're saying here to take part in that. That's a new, really innovative idea. That's a great way to stand in solidarity with Greta Thunberg and the heroic school climate strikers who are begging for their lives. You know, they're begging for the right to have a future at all. And we adults absolutely owe them that. And where can they get information on that? Oh, it, it's that's all over the, uh, the the web now. September the 20th, it's called the, the Earth Strike. Um, uh, the Youth Strike for Climate are, are supporting it. Um, the most important power of all, though, I want to claim, is the power that was shown so clearly by Extinction Rebellion in April of this year. That is what has been transformative above anything else in this country and to some extent the world uh, this year. And what I'm desperately and earnestly hope, hoping is going to move forward as we move into our new phase of rebellion uh, this October. In April this year, thousands upon thousands of us did nonviolent civil disobedience for two weeks in London. And we held uh, symbolic uh, public spaces um, for much of that uh, period and 1,100 of us were arrested and it transformed forever the conversation around ecology and around climate in this country as people were forced to contemplate what we were talking about, what we were putting our bodies on the line to make a point about as we finally got some proper access to the media. And I think a lot of people went through this process of initially being kind of uh, uh, annoyed, inconvenienced, etc., to sort of talking about it and thinking about it and reflecting and then maybe grudgingly or whatever, thinking, well, acknowledging, well, maybe they've got a point and where well, you've got to admire that, that they, they really do stand up for their principles. And by the end of it, transformation of public understanding of the issue, transformation of people's views on the issue. Opinion polls very, very clear. Two thirds of British people after the after the April rebellion saying there is a climate emergency, um, the environment shooting up the, the uh, uh, people's priorities such that it went above immigration, above the economy. Really? Absolutely extraordinary. Wow. Who would have thought that was even possible uh, a year ago? And now in the latest poll, 85 percent of people in this country saying they're concerned uh, about the climate issue. It's a real concern of theirs. Way, way more than used to be uh, concerned uh, about it. So I want to make the claim that mass, nonviolent, direct action, targeted breaking of the law when the law is an ass, when the law and government are sending us to, to destruction, sending our children to their death, sending us all uh, into collapse, that that is the most powerful thing of all that we can do at this moment in history. And we're following in the footsteps, of course, of people like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the suffragettes. Our task is even harder than theirs because we are trying to change uh, the entire system, a system that is addicted to uh, fossil fuels, including uh, in agriculture, but all across uh, the economy. We've got to change that system together. We've got to change it quickly. But people, I think, are starting to get to the point where they're, where they're willing to do that. And what I'm earnestly hoping is that more and more people will join us on the streets of London in October and bring that, proce that process to a kind of completion. And then we can win the Citizens' Assembly that we need in order to, to decide how to make those changes. And this is happening in cities all over the world? This is happening in cities all over the world, especially uh, in Europe. Uh, there'll be uh, a big one um, in uh, Berlin. Uh, there'll be a big one in Paris. Uh, they'll be the biggest one of all uh, in London. There'll be stuff going on in other parts of Britain as well. And anyone who really can't get to London, you know, you can do stuff where you are. But anyone who has the capacity to come to London in October, that is the single most important thing that you can do now to stand up for ecology and climate. It's been proven by what we did in April uh, that it works. So our rebellion begins on October the 7th. And I would urge anyone listening who's convinced by what we're saying here to come and join us for that. 
I uh, in April was that when Marble Arch was shut down. As yeah, well? yeah. Because I actually went, I, I, did, I did go down there. I'm, I have to say I wasn't actually there actively protesting. I was sort of reporting on it and um, just showing solidarity. And when I compared it to like Occupy London Stock Exchange, I definitely it's interesting. So when Occupy London Stock Exchange happened. Um, I can't remember where they originally, what well, they were at the stock exchange, but then they got moved to St. Paul's Cathedral. Yeah. I don't know if that's where they got moved to. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then they stayed there for ages, but it wasn't really blocking or disrupting yeah. anything. And eventually they got cleared away. Yeah. And people are always talking about, do you really need to make an inconvenience to stop people living their lives? And I've always been sort of in two minds undecided about it of like to what extent you disrupt um, sort of potential allies as opposed to the power structures. Yes. But then when I went to Marble Arch, I didn't. I couldn't actually believe that you'd literally camped in the. You'd shut down the roads yeah. like these yeah. massive arteries had yeah. actually been shut down, yeah. and you'd actually taken control. And w- what I'd realised was that the courageous stand. And some people might disagree with this, but I mean, I think even if they don't believe in the ideology or the campaign, that it's courageous to go out there and, and block a, a main artery in London the way that you had. Yeah. Um it, it actually worked. Yeah. Um because I and it, it kind of That's the is, bottom line. And it, it it's, it's a metaphor for this whole thing, which is half measures aren't just good enough in terms of dealing with a solution, but a half measure isn't actually effective at all. Like if we're gonna do something about it, we have to go all in. Yeah. Because that is when um because if you go in a half measure, the power structures will go, well this will pass. Whereas yeah. if you go full in, it's like okay, we've we've now got to yeah. have a discussion about. You've got to this. be committed. You've got to make you've got to make clear that you're you're there to stay. You've got to make clear that if the law tries to move against you, you're gonna you're gonna carry on acting resolutely. You've got to be clear that you're absolutely non-violent, and that's one of the reasons why Extinction Rebellion has been so successful so far because we've been completely non-violent, and that's how we will remain always. And if you are those things, then you can transform. You can transform consciousness, and that's what's been happening this year uh, for n- a number of reasons, a number of things coming together, but the, the crucial one is what we did uh, in April, and we're going to seek to replicate that in October. That is the, the single most important thing that we can do now to change the trajectory that we're on. Let me also say that it's, I think, obvious to everyone now in Britain that we are in the midst of an extreme democratic crisis and that's understatement the, yeah, of the year. <laughs> that's the reason. That's the reason why ultimately um, we've had to resort to nonviolent direct action. If Parliament were working properly, if government were working properly, we wouldn't have to be doing this. You know, right. nobody wants to go to the cells. Nobody wants to go to prison. Nobody wants to be dragged away by the police. Nobody wants to have to take enormous amounts of time and energy and money uh, away from their work to do this kind of thing. We're doing it because there is no alternative, and. I think in this democratic crisis now, there is a real opportunity for for understanding of this to increase. So I want to su- to suggest um, a, a radical way through the huge crisis that we've got into around around the failure around the climate and ecology issues, but also obviously around Brexit. Um, and what it could be, and, and you hinted at it before, Miles, is citizens' assemblies, right? Parliament and, gov- and government are in a standoff. Nobody feels adequately represented. The, the politicians have manifestly failed on climate, manifestly failed on ecology, and manifestly failed also now on, on Brexit. So why don't we look to citizens' assemblies to sort this out? Here's wh- what, I would, what I would recommend uh, as a, an honest, serious, possible way through this crisis. If we were to have a government of national unity that were formed, that was not saying we're gonna we're gonna be here for years and years and years, but was gonna be was saying we're gonna be here till we've got some kind of basic trajectory through these crises. And what this government of national unity, which I would assume would consist of the vast majority of Labour MPs, the SNP MPs, Plaid Cymru, uh, the Lib Dem MPs, Greens, um, and also of course some um, Conservative MPs uh, rebelling against their party and standing up for the greater good. Uh, of the country, and between them all, those those groups could form a majority government of national unity. And what this government would 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 say would be not we're going to try to impose our will on the nation, but we're going to hand it over to you, 
the citizens to sort out these unholy messes. And I would say what we need is three powerful citizens' assemblies to sort out three messes. Number one, of course, the climate and ecological emergency, which is the most dire and uh, determinative crisis of them all. Number two, the Brexit crisis, which is much less important, but in the short term is paralyzing us and is of some importance, including, by the way, to the issues of climate and ecology. If we have a no deal uh, crash out exit, that's potentially disastrous for the precautionary principle, for all sorts of environmental protections that we have. We could get chlorinated chicken forced upon us by the Trump administration and so on and so on and so on. And, and that's not hyperbole. That's not no no. That's that simple fact. And uh, and I've written about that. People can Google that stuff if they want to. Uh, and the third one would be a citizens' assembly to address the manifest failure of our political and democratic system itself. We direly need constitutional reform. We need a written constitution. We're in a consti constitutional crisis now because we don't have one. Right. And we need massive democratic reform. If we're going to have representative democracy continuing at all, and it is now you know, coming into question in some quarters, then it needs to have all sorts of changes, including campaign finance reform, uh, including obviously a move to a fair voting system, a proportional representation system and so forth. So that would be me my pitch right now in this terrible crisis that we have a government of national unity which says we want three citizen assemblies to sort thing out, sort things out. One on climate and ecology, one on Brexit, one on democratic and constitutional reform. I th I could see the country getting united around that and the wonderful thing about citizen assemblies is obviously they involve citizens and also they don't need politicians to show a kind of leadership that, frankly, it appears most politicians are incapable of exercising. Instead, politicians can be led by the citizens, led by the people. Yeah, I get that, because I think there's a lot of discussion in politics of there being sort of two types of leader. And although I ag agree with the description in the past, I'm not sure how useful it is being in one camp or the other. And that is you're either a, a wind vane or a signpost. So you're either yeah. saying this is public opinion therefore this is now my position on an issue and on the flip side it's regardless of what the public think this is the right thing to do yeah and I obviously think we need more weather vanes and want more weather vanes obviously that's better than than just swinging in the uh, swinging in the uh no, hang on. No, so we're signposts. Yeah, yeah, signposts. Yeah, I, was, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, we need I more thought you were doing your third way thing again. Uh, no, no, like, no. I'm going to take a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, got that wrong. Sorry. <laughs> no. Obviously, we need more signposts. But the thing is, it's very, very, it's a very tough ask for politicians to be resolute signposts without either being kind of uh, losing touch with the people and being accused of, uh, of being um, dictatorial mm. and stuff like that um, or being voted out. Right. And the citizens assemblies, they're not going to be um, selected by vote. Right. They're going to be selected by lot like a jury is. They're not going to be vulnerable to the same pressures, including also crucially money pressures that politicians are, are, are subject to. So citizens assemblies can help politicians and many politicians are, are deeply well-meaning. Uh, they can help politicians to do the things they want to do anyway, but that they've manifestly failed to do. I think citizens assemblies genuinely could be a way through these connected connected crises that we now face. Yes, it's really interesting you saying that because, um, and I, I forgive me listeners if I've mentioned this on a previous podcast, it, this blends in with my day-to-day -day conversations with people. Um, but I remember hearing a discussion on the radio once about different types of political systems. And this is an uncomfortable one to discuss. But for example, most Western democracies if they have a four-year, five-year election cycle, uh, politicians will go for short-term gains and therefore mm. it prevents us from yeah. looking at long-term yeah. um, solutions. Um, but we'd agree that having democracy and accountability is important, where yeah. on the flip side, you can look at the Chinese government that has put loads of resources and investments across the world for the next 40 years um, because they don't have elections. They don't have to worry about pleasing the public in the short term. Uh, Although, let me just say something about that, because on the one hand, you're right. And, and uh, I, I, I would just add at the end of that, I'm not saying that's no, the system I, know, I want. I, know. I just wanted it was an important... But even, uh, yeah, yeah. even on its own terms, I think the claim needs to be deconstructed a little. The Chinese government has shown uh, great leadership in relation to uh, renewable energy, uh, for example. Uh, and they've shown great leadership in their idea of an ecological civilization. Sure. Um, 
yeah, bring I, that I wasn't idea talking into... specifically to this issue. I just meant in terms of how they govern themselves and for their own country's benefit. I know, yeah. but it's still more complicated, you oh, see, yeah, Miles, yeah. because because the idea of an ecological civilization, great, but then you look at what they're actually doing, and what they're actually doing also um, is massive uh, industrial development. I mean, I'm putting it in scare quotes right. because is it really development? I don't think I don't think it's any kind of improvement to have the kind of vast pollution that they've got now, to have the huge numbers of utterly uh, climatically destructive coal power, coal fired power stations right, yeah. uh, that they're uh, that they're bringing in now, etc. You look at their Belt and Road program, deeply, deeply uh, destructive yep. of any common future for us. So uh, the Chinese government uh, is doing some really good things that our government has failed to show leadership on, and it may be able to do those really good things because it's not uh, democratically accountable. It's also doing really terrible things. Now, why is it doing these really terrible things? And there my claim would, make a slight, would take slight issue with what you said because I believe that one of the main reasons why they're doing these terrible things is because they're scared of their own people. They're scared that if they don't give their people more and more stuff, more and more material goods, yep. more and more so-called developments, then the people will rebel um, and revolt. Uh, now, what does that imply? Well, that Im what that implies is that the Chinese government are not invulnerable to democratic pressures. And <coughs> what we need to do is somehow create a system that helps bring people on board with not putting um, everything um, at risk um, in pursuit of so-called uh, material goods and so on and so forth. Now, how do we do that? Well, my claim would be that we do it by transforming consciousness. Uh, and we transform consciousness by by various means, including, of course, you know, education and so on and so forth. But the, the game changer that we're seeing in Britain is the work of Extinction Rebellion. The game changer that we're seeing is the work of Extinction Rebellion in the context of the, the weather chaos, in the context of the climate school strikes, in the context of David Attenborough and so on and so forth. What we need to do is create a system which is both democratically responsive and showing the leadership that we need and doing it on the basis not of pandering to people's short-termist desires or consumerist desires, but, but responding to people's most deeply held needs and values like their care for their children, their love for the natural world, their desire for there to be some kind of stable and secure future. And that, I think, is going to be something which a citizens' assembly could give, which the Chinese government cannot give, yep. and that the British government, as it's currently constituted, cannot give. I, I actually agree with you, and I'm, I'm really glad you pulled me up on that, because I, I do think that is why the citizens' assembly, it kind of mitigates. I think, obviously, the Chinese government is way worse in terms of the democratic, uh, or un because of its undemocratic system. Um, but I think on the flip side, the short-term gain is saying from our side, we need to you know, work out when I think that's why yeah. it's and assembly. only and only if we do that, you see, only if we do that will be we be any in any position to show any kind of positive example to countries like China and India. Because of course what those countries are always saying at the moment is, well, it's all very well for you to say, oh please, you know, you've got to take care of the environment and so on. But you're rich. You know, we want to become as rich as you uh, and then we'll start listening we to you. We want to follow really in your footsteps. Exactly, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and what we need to say is no, don't follow in our footsteps. And the reason you shouldn't follow in our footsteps is that we regret our own footsteps and we're going to pull back. We're going to pull back. We're going we're gonna to have some significant deindustrialization. We're going to phase out these damaging industries fast. We're going to move away from the private uh, motor vehicle. We're going to move towards an ecological uh, civilization. And we're going to take inspiration um, from those in the world uh, who have already um, taken that kind of path. And who do I mean there? I mean the indigenous peoples, uh, and I mean many of the peasant peoples of the world. These are the peoples we should be looking for now, looking towards now. People in the global south, like the tribes in the in the Amazon, for example, who are standing up so bravely against the destruction there. Those are our greatest inspirations, and we in Extinction Rebellion are inspired above all by them, by those people who've been putting their lives on the line for for and their freedom on the line uh, uh, for for years, for decades, for generations, right? And if we take that path, and if we say we, we don't want to carry on developing, we don't want to carry on growing, 
uh, we want to actually um, go back to the future. We want to actually p- pursue um, a path which is going to be open to this beautiful coincidence that a really different way of living that is inspired by indigenous peoples, inspired by peasants peoples, inspired by, by great wisdom traditions, inspired by the great philosophers. If we do all of that, then it's just possible that people in China and India, which of course have great wisdom traditions of their own, might start to say, all right, well, maybe we won't follow you down your development path then. And then, and that is one of our few remaining hopes, because of course, if they do fully uh, so-called industrialize, and if they do follow in our footsteps, the whole world is finished. I agree, and 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 also the technological solutions, and and I, I know we shouldn't just wait for technological solutions to come about. Um, will make uh, industry cheaper, uh, and so that if we do take the lead, and you know, it's, it's the arguments about subsidisation of yeah. we should stop subsidising fossil fuels, and yeah. um, you know, put it more on renewable Absolutely. energies, yeah. and, and then and then that can then be exported to the world. That gives us an export market of technologies if we're leading. Although we should also do free technology transfer, right? And other of the ways we should help countries like um, India and uh, poorer countries in Africa is just by giving them stuff, you know. And you're not you're not just talking about open source. Well, that's obviously a part of it, but you you mean actually the products as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. open source, yes. um, But also we should be just giving them, you know, passive solar. We should just be giving them all sorts of uh, sorry, what's passive solar? Passive solar is things like. uh, windows in buildings which uh, uh, ab- absorb um, heat and and keep houses warm without needing any heating source uh, at right. all. Really, really good for, for example, um, uh, colder climates. So um, people in uh, in say uh, uh, Chile, uh, 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 Bolivia, um, Paraguay, um, people living um, in much of China. Um, uh, quite substantial numbers of people in the world, uh, people living in this country for that matter, could hugely benefit from um, passive solar. Um, it's a technology uh, which is pretty mature now. Uh, and as I say, the beauty of it is you don't even need renewable energy. It right. just it just harnesses, uh, it just it just keeps the, the, the heat in. It's sort, of, it's sort of the good side of the greenhouse effect, if you will, right? You have a little, little create a little, little miniature greenhouse uh, in your in your house that kind of technology we shouldn't even be selling we should be giving away to stop people from um destructively uh, burning biomass and destructively burning um uh, fossil fuels i, I remember when working a couple of years in construction um w- we were working on a school and on the sports pitch we dug up a trench that went in a, a wiggly line zigzagging and then we put pipes down that were god maybe seven feet deep and that was the the whole school heating system. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, that that was the first I, I ground know, source heat pump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And um, you know, they say it's obviously something you wouldn't do for an individual house, but new neighbourhoods could do it. But yeah. I was blown away yeah. by when I think of like the Earth's heat. I'm always yeah. as a kid, I was always thinking it's if you go deep enough. Yeah. But actually, it doesn't have to be that deep. No, for no. You, you take for granted how much warmth there is yeah. just within those first. That's, few a, feet. that's a ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps are an excellent. Uh, kind of renewable energy uh, technology, which again we should be uh, we should be subsidising, but but where appropriate we should be simply giving. Um, when when poor countries are are dependent upon coal, for example, uh, it makes uh, makes ecological sense and even economic sense to give them uh, more intelligent. Uh, uh, technologies, because going back to what we said earlier, there's no economy on a dead planet. There's no jobs on a dead planet. There's no Brexit on a dead planet, for that matter. Um, this, the crisis is profoundly, profoundly urgent, and we need to think outside, uh, outside the box in terms of things like free technology transfer. And when we start listing, um, I've just loaded up a, a cartoon that I know you would have seen before, um, and many people have, which is of a climate summit. And on the front of the screen, they've got like energy independence, preserve rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, air, healthy children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And someone is standing up in the audience and says, "What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing?" See, that is the beautiful coincidence. That that is it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I wanted to flag that up because I always reflect on that when, mm-hmm. again, speaking to people that don't necessarily believe in climate change or don't think it's a crisis i'm just i start listing 
I, I sort of briefly mentioned it earlier about the decentralization of power structures, but just, you know, walking through London thinking, imagine if all these cars were electric, how clean, like people who live in London, I think don't know. It's kind of like asking a, a fish if it can see water, just uh, yeah. uh, only because I, I, I live outside in Reading. When I commute, I taste it, you know, every time I go into London. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's shocking. Yeah. Do you know the following interesting fact? Extinction Rebellion in April, uh, as we were saying earlier, we there was no traffic around Marble Arch, no traffic around Oxford Circus, no traffic on Waterloo Bridge, no traffic through Parliament Square. Air pollution, there were some queues of traffic around the edges of this, and yeah. there people were complaining and saying, oh, you're causing air pollution, etc. Of course, if you're in a stationary traffic, you should always turn off your engine anyway. <laughs> uh, it's actually the law. Um, Is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, 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 <laughs> the, the, yeah, the more important uh, 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 fact is is this. Air pollution fell in London during Extinction Rebellion. That is fact, as measured by the air pollution machines that are around there, right? Um, imagine a future in which there is much of London is not just for electric vehicles, but closed to motorized traffic, right? Imagine a future in which it's just uh, just uh, bikes and people on foot and trams and so on and so forth. Possibly, I don't know, the odd horse and cart, right? Imagine how much quieter it would be. Imagine how much better the air would be, etc. This is the kind of positive future that we should be daring to imagine. Just a point on electric vehicles, by the way. They are in danger of being a false solution, right? If, really? If all, yeah, I'm afraid so. If all we do is replace the motor vehicles we've got with uh, with uh, with electric vehicles, we are not going to make it. If you try to if you try to have um, China with everyone having their uh, own car, no, I agree. And it's that. all electric electric but cars. But they're not they're not we're not going to make it. What we need to do is have a future where we've got probably a small number of electric right. vehicles that are that are shared sort of yes. car pooling whatever. Um, and then um, an efficient uh, public transport system with trams, electric buses, uh, uh, trains, etc. Um, that's the kind of future that, that could work. But don't get dragged into thinking that electric vehicles by themselves, electric cars are going to be uh, a solution. By themselves, I'm afraid they're not. So, so I'm going to push back now uh, okay. on a way because I, I agree with that completely in sense of not everyone owning a car. Um, yeah. So I, I did a video eight years ago about the concept of ownership and how that what people actually want is access to goods and services yes so the example i give is like if you live on a street where everyone has a lawn everyone owns a lawnmower but who mm. actually needs to use their lawnmower yeah. every day absolutely could you all share one yes but the reason that everyone owns one is for access you want to know that it's available at any time because we're lonely because we don't have enough community uh, that that too as well yeah. and so i mentioned about automated cars and so the future that I envisage, and I think it is a sort of a hybrid of what you were saying and, and what I'm about to lay out here, which is yeah. if you can imagine the service Uber, but it's automated cars, um, they're solar powered, it means you need less cars on the road, they're networked so they know the positioning of other cars, it will pick you up where you are to where you need to go and then pick up the next person. And so it's it's a form of efficiency mm -hmm. um, and they'd be safer because there'd be no uh, human uh, drivers. Um, and uh, eight years ago, most of the comments on that video were like, but I like to drive. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, but a lot of people like to horse ride, but they go away. You know, you, you'll still be able to drive cars on racetracks and that. But I, I, I returned to that topic maybe three, four years ago. The comments were like a complete 180 of people going, yeah, I can believe that. And, and what I've realized is because the rate of change in technology and information that we're exposed mm. to is on an exponential it's we're being exposed to it on an exponential rate we've created this um this sort of uh, paradigm uh where the general mentality of people is no longer a question of if but when mm -hmm. and that makes me hopeful when it comes to adopting new solutions that i think that people are willing to let go of some of these things yeah. so yeah the only thing i was going to say on cars is the idea of everyone owning electric car i completely agree people leave them on their driveways for you know most of the day yeah. or wherever they're going yeah people say they enjoy driving they don't enjoy traffic jams they don't yeah. enjoy uh, finding car parking spaces yeah, yeah. or road tax and all these sort of things. People want the access of getting from A to B. And if there is a better form of transport, like, um, uh, you know, even um, conveyor belts, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, like the Jetsons, like we laugh, but that could actually be... Yeah, no, I don't think I don't think the Jetsons is going to do it. <laughs> no, no. Because, of, because, because uh, those kind of propulsion things, it's like it's like a miniature kind of uh, aircraft. It, it's, it takes an enormous amount to 
the, the lift off from the ground. Oh no, yeah, problem. sorry, I, I I meant literally <laughs> the conveyor belt. Oh, right. sorry, I thought you meant the yeah, jetpack. No, I, I, thing. I forgot about that one. Yeah, no, definitely not that. No. Um, no, I, I think the conveyor belt is possible. It'd be like escalators, right? Yeah. Escalators are quite efficient. I'm um, a bit of a fraud, by the way. I never watched the Jetsons. <laughs> right, but I don't think we're so far apart. Yeah. Just just a couple of points. One, um, I think it's problematic to imagine this future as kind of uh, a sort of uh, kind of better version of Uber in the, in as much as uh, you're imagining people being individually in these cars. We need to get used to car sharing sure. more. We need to think of um, energy as a precious public good. We need to think about road space as a precious uh, public good. And we also need to look at the plus sides of, uh, of sharing uh, space. Um, so there are cultures, uh, we're not very good at this here uh, in, uh, in England on uh, trains, but there are cultures where um, people actually enjoy taking journeys uh, together yeah. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we do a bit of this on the bus in this country, but in some other countries, buses and indeed uh, trains are, are, and, and mini buses and so on are genuinely sort of communal enterprises. People sort of get to know each other. It, they they kind of connect people and so on. So if, if we're imagining something like that and we're imagining kind of these driverless uh, cars and sometimes there would be two people and sometimes three people, yeah. sometimes it would take slightly longer and be slightly less inconvenient. But that's the kind of thing we're going to have to be serious about facing up to people would be facing fine. up to the crisis people would be fine with that though because if you're not driving it you're not thinking that a route you're getting on with other things and, and, and it yeah. can be uh, and it can be cheaper of course if you share it and uh, as i said it could be more social and also i'm not sure we want to go down this route but i do think we need to be cautious uh, before we go uh, full blown into driverless cars i'm nervous about driverless cars for a number of reasons the main reason is i'm nervous about them being hacked and i'm nervous about the uh, the, the possibilities for uh, unprecedented uh, terrorist type uh, outrages i would want to be very very reassured on that front before i trusted our whole network to driverless cars i think that's something that can be unavoid i i agree i share your concerns but i think with any sort of long distance transport because things are going to all be run online. I, I remember many years ago, do you know what? It might have been fake news, but it was of, a, I think it was of a nuclear submarine that had the blue screen of death on one of their screens, right. Microsoft. I, I think it was maybe something else they were running. I'm sure it wasn't actually running the nuclear component but this sort of idea of everything is going to be computerized and everything yeah, is vulnerable but, but but sure but be careful what you wish for right because uh you start to get into a situation where terminator type scenarios are, are not just science fiction <laughs> oh no I'm, I'm no I'm, I'm with you on that and and so i know people like elon musk are talking about open source ai yes because you know technology progresses whether we like it or not it outsteps our laws like so, so a, a great example would be the gun debate um, you know, in America, a huge debate of should we be banning guns? People are 3D printing guns by downloading blueprints online via the dark web or just from the web and printing it in countries where guns are banned. I don't think you're ever going to get laws that are going to be able to... Well, but 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 if they're so doing about, that, it's about it's, changing the culture. Sure, and, I agree. But if they're doing that and it's illegal, probably a lot less people will be doing it than if it's legal. But terrorists aren't of, thinking about like I, I don't know if p people are ideologically yeah. driven, they're willing to take that risk. Sure, uh, th and th it only takes one person. Always, well, uh, uh, I would put put back to you that it only takes uh, uh, one highly skilled person to uh, to uh, hack a driverless car potentially. No, no, I, I agree. Um, so, look, you s I think, again, this is an area where we might disagree slightly. You, you say you, you can't t stop technology, but I want to suggest that we've reached a point in our uh, evolution where we should be willing to stop uh, some technologies um, because uh, technologies now have the power to destroy us. Uh, I think that we should be willing to raise deep questions, which I've raised in my work with Nassim Taleb, for example, about uh, genetic uh, modification technologies. I think it's very clear that we should be raising deep questions about uh, geoengineering technologies. If listeners don't know what geoengineering is, geoengineering is the idea that we sort of try to hack the entire planet and control the weather and climate of the entire planet by mirrors in space or whatever. I think such technologies would be profoundly irresponsible, uh, and I've written uh, about that in the Greenhouse book, Facing Up to Climate Reality. Um, I think that we should decide together not to employ those technologies uh, and we should decide together instead to take a different path. 
And in relation to artificial intelligence, I think we're reaching the point where we should make uh, we should be willing to make social decisions to make certain kinds of uh, artificial intelligence development um, illegal, and that may be hard to police. But I think the the effort to police it will be worth it relative to the alternative, which is you just allow things to let rip, and then you could get new kinds of appalling uh, utopias, which people are starting to talk of. So the the broad point is. I think that historically we've we've thought you can't stop the inevitable forward movement of technology, but I think we've reached a point in our in our evolution and with the threats that we've now brought onto ourselves through our technology, where we actually have to be ready to question that. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about what you said because I, no, I agree with very much of it, and I'm trying to think of a way of uh, wording my thoughts in a way that's not going to sound too crazy. I mean, I mean, an example would be. We've had terrorist attacks where people have taken vans and driven it into members of the public and yeah. killed numbers, of, huge numbers of people. Most people don't do that, and we have the technology available. Uh, and I, th- but I w- here's a worry about driverless cars, right? Might there be a really, really smart cyber terrorist who could, um, like in that episode of Black Mirror where it happened with the the artificial bees? And if you saw that I one, very, that one. No, no, very, yeah, very brilliant, imagine. very scary. Yeah, 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 yeah. All the artificial bees uh, get simultaneously uh, hacked and they all become killer bees. Right. Um, can we rule out that that could happen with driverless cars? So you wouldn't just have one van driving into a crowd of people. You'd have every single van in the country doing it. I, I agree. And, and actually there was um, a, a, a campaign online which was against autonomous robots. There's pushes for the UN to say that... Um, killing machines cannot be mm. autonomous they have yeah. to be controlled by a human um and the campaign was very similar where they're showing it's done as a fake sort of corporate speech um to like defense contractors where they've made these little drones that fly and what you do is you put in the details of the subject and then it will fly and it literally it's really quite gratuitous it like it goes on the side of your temple and just instantly bullet in you know takes out that's very no, like no, this black yeah, mirror yeah, 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 yeah. and they say there's no collateral damage and <laughs> yeah, basically great. in the later in the clip there's news reports and there's like students at school who are campaigning against you know climate change and that you know mm. threatening the institutions and basically a terrorist organization has now hacked and it goes to the point of like who is the bad guy you know if we're using these devices to patrol good you know who the bad people who are the mm. terrorists mm. depends on who makes the decisions um, the reason I bring that up is there are it's it's all about power play in society, mm. and I think that um, it's why I'm for decentralizing um, our power structures, so like nuclear power, because um, I'm still undecided on nuclear power. By the way, in the sense of I'd rather us not use it, but I think that um, I think it is a cleaner use in some ways compared to fossil fuels and i'd rather us not use it but i think that it might have to be in the transition um can we yeah, address that yeah briefly? yeah yeah yeah. because uh, as you may know this is something i've written about and spoken about quite a bit yes. so i'm very skeptical of, of nuclear power and we could talk about this for ages of course but I'll, as well as not really agreeing that it's that it's clean um, I, I meant cleaner could, than fossil fuel well like, it's yeah. obviously it's 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 less fossil fuel hungry uh, in the short to medium term. But it's how you get it's rid not, of it. It's not, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. In the long term, it's not even clear it's less fossil fuel hungry because you've got this massive open-ended commitment to dealing with the waste. But here's the the real kicker for nuclear power, which I don't think has been adequately considered uh, yet. Unless we get to some kind of um, um, uh, fusion type system or you know one of the other kind of small scale uh, uh, nuclear things which are being talked about but they've always been talked about as 50 years away you know <laughs> unless we get to one of those if you're talking about nuclear power which is anything like the nuclear power we have at present and that's the reality of the nuclear power that we're yeah. being offered at present at Hinkley Point at Sizewell and so on if you're talking about nuclear power there's anything like that it produces waste that lasts is, lasts an in, basically an indefinite period of time and it produces highly toxic uh, waste highly dangerous waste that last for hundreds of years you need to keep the spent fuel rods cool for hundreds of years right and if you don't uh, they will um uh they will boil dry uh, of their own accord they will catch fire of their own accord and they will burn um um toxic uh, fires into the atmosphere for decades or hundreds of years it was the concern now, with fukushima and, and the, the water yeah, yeah. With, with fukushima something like this nearly happened yes. at, at fukushima it started to happen um now Tragically, we are in a situation where we can no longer guarantee 
the forward efficacy of our society. And even if you say, oh, we'll, we'll go nuclear, you can't guarantee it anymore. Yep. We are in a situation where it is highly likely, it's highly likely that there will be collapses in at least some major organized societies in the next generation or, or two. Um, because that's how far over the cliff uh, we are uh, now. Um, so we have to think about what's called deep adaptation. We have to think about making the future as safe as we can against the possibility of collapse. In other words, we have to say, if we assume that, that collapse is going to happen, what's our insurance policy for that not leading to a kind of total meltdown? Now, in that context, which we haven't really thought of yet, people haven't been willing to face it head on yet, but it's what I talk about in my work. It's what Jem Bendel talks about in his work, including his essay, Deep Adaptation, which I also recommend to people. Um, in that context nuclear power starts to look like an insane, reckless gamble. And rather than opening new nuclear power stations with the hope that they might help to our, um, reducing our carbon emissions, we should be moving to shut down nuclear power stations. We should definitely not be opening new ones, and we should be moving to make safe the nuclear waste that we've already generated, which is going to be incredibly hard, incredibly hard. Uh, and we should be moving to try to uh, defragilize um, uh, our our system, um, both in terms of, uh, as I say, guarding against nuclear meltdowns, but also in terms of taking care of the waste, especially the, the high-level waste, especially the, the spent fuel rods. So you put all that together. What it seems to me to indicate is that if you are serious about facing up to climate reality, if you are serious about facing up to the very real threat now, that whatever we do, collapse is now possible, um, then you have to think that nuclear power is not any more a sane option. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. Um, and yeah, and, and just the, the the end point I was going to say with nuclear power in the sense of decentralization is the, the reason we need that is because then it's not a terrorist target, for example. Um, you know, Sorry, how do you mean? Uh, so so, I, so the, the reason I talk about uh, you know nuclear power as a, a centralised power system oh, yeah. is, is, is just because it is a threat point. You know, people worry about um, target points for terrorist activity yeah, and, yeah, and things yeah, like that. And so by decentralising... Yeah anything you decentralize the risk yeah but the but on the flip side technology is actually empowering the individual um so we can talk about 3d printing with guns and and so i, I, think, I, think, the, the I real, think this could be a whole other conversation but uh, i think the real hope here for me you see is with what the stuff we've already talked about yes the the, the one of the the beautiful coincidences if you like about genuinely renewable technologies uh, i'm talking there about air horse air source heat pump ground source heat pump um all good forms of solar, yes. um, uh, wind power, wave power, um, uh, water power, um, is that is that the mostly these are inherently uh, more or less decentralized. Yes, right? they are. And they should be more so. And we should be looking at, you know, community power grids, and we should obviously be having a lot more. Um, we should be having passive solar a lot more. We should be having um, solar hot water on people's houses a lot more. You know, truly decentralized uh, uh, systems. Uh, and, you know... Yeah, you, you think about what a what a terrorist would do. Um, they might uh, bother uh, destroying a, 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 an oil refinery or blowing up a gas terminal. They would certainly love to hit a, a, a nuclear power station with a, an aircraft or, or something. But no, no terrorist is ever going to target your uh, your 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 <laughs> yeah. solar or water system. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 and that, and that, that's exactly it. And and also. Um, I want to clarify to the audience that, and I, I think you touched upon this right at the beginning about whether you're being an optimist or a pessimist when you're dealing with these issues. Uh, just to recap what I've to told people before, if I enter a conversation laying out what I think the problems are, people go, Miles, you're such a pessimist. I'm like, I've not mentioned what the solutions are. And on the other side, if I lay out some solutions, they go, oh, you're such an optimist. I'm like, mm. well, I haven't explained what's at risk. Although I've just stressed how the individual empowerment with technology means anyone could do something really bad with technology i think what it does is it gives us an opportunity to change the culture where people feel more empowered to feel yeah. i can really change the world for the better and actually a lot of the driving forces that cause people to do very horrific bad things 
is often because they don't have a sense of belonging or that they are in complete disarray with mm. their lifestyle, oh, yeah, maybe of lack of opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't really want to make it blanket statements. There are, of course, exceptions to the rule, and that is an oversimplification. Mm. But I do feel there is an opportunity that if we do empower the individuals, which is a very libertarian principle, it actually does add to community because it means people have more to give to the world. And so yeah. when we were talking about 3D printing or even transport, if people are using solar power, it might be that you, we don't have money in the future. We have a credit system of... I've produced this amount of energy from my house. So when I go traveling on public transport, I slot it in and it's, you know, my credits are based on how much power I've produced to ensure that we're carbon neutral. Um, and if I want to download a product onto a 3D printer, it takes that into consideration as well. And mm. also, you know, I might download goods and services on a 3D printer, but I might also design something really cool and upload it to share with the world. Mm. And I actually do think that there is, as one option of what the future is, and I don't think this is going to be a choice, I think it's just going to be the way we get steered, is I think we're in some way going to go towards a barter system again. But I don't think it's going to be, I'll give you a cow. <laughs> Everyone always talks about mm. that, like, I'll give you a cow, I'll give you a chicken. I think it will actually be uh, an open economy of ideas and energy i think mm. those are the two things and people will just contribute what they want they'll have the freedom um yeah. and i actually think it will give more value to people's lives because i often talk about in activism when you look at i know lots of people that work in care homes which are very difficult jobs you look at doctors and that who or nurses you know who don't necessarily get the best pay and they work ridiculously long hours and they do mm. it because they love to but when you look at volunteers the moment they have to stop volunteering is when they have to put up their hands and go I've now got to go pay the bills yeah. and it shows you that we have this um system that kind of discourages um more com and i say discourages because there are as i said exceptions to the rule where people really do go for it 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 means people are willing to do jobs that perhaps are less beneficial for society but mm. just make sure they can keep their head above water yeah um and i yeah. know in america at the moment with candidates democratic candidates like andrew yang who's talking about universal basic income and I, I won't go into that now but his interesting point with that is if you gave everybody a one and a half thousand dollars a day uh, sorry a, a month unconditionally it means that we can redefine what valuable work is because he mentions that his wife looks after one of his children who has autism mm. and he says what does our current market system value her work as zero mm. and we yeah. know in fact it's the complete opposite yeah. and so if you gave everybody that amount of money it means that if you do take care of an elderly person or uh, someone with needs that actually you can keep your head above water and you know so I'm, I'm not getting into the solutions but i think that that's the way of thinking of how do yeah. we create a society that rewards people who just contribute um, and i think people like george monbio have mentioned that we talk about um, there's he, he talks about the spectrum of like you've got the market uh, and government, but he says like there's another yeah. um, which is like the is community or uh, yeah I, and, the, and the commons the, the commons sorry that's yeah. it yeah 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 did you talk a Look, bit about that yeah, yeah yeah the commons is a big theme of uh, of my work I think it's a very important um, thing for the future that that we need to get beyond the uh, the the, 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 the False dichotomy. I think it's all about either individuals or, or in a market or state. Uh, and the commons, uh, you know, based on ideas like literally common land and so on. But you can see new examples of it in in, um, in common spaces on the internet and in open source and so on. Um, I think the commons is a very important idea for the future. And I think in general, what you've been saying in the last couple of minutes, you know, these are the kind of ideas that we need to be batting around and pretty soon starting to implement. These are the kind of ideas that a citizens' assembly might uh, might choose between. Um, the bottom line is that the future will be more decentralized. Yeah. The future will be more localized, whether people like it or not. Again, the only question is, are we going to be intelligent enough to move in the direction of deliberately reducing supply lines, deliberately reducing the emissions that come from long distance uh, transport, deliberately making ourselves more secure, deliberately building better local community, etc. Are we going to be wise enough to do all of that? Or is localization going to be forced upon us by uh, an absolutely chaotic societal collapse? Those are the alternatives we face. This is why I say um, in a rather dramatic but truthful phrase that this civilization is finished. That's what this talk of mine that went viral mm. and I've now got a book called This Civilization is Finished. That's what it means. doesn't mean we're bound to collapse. 
Yeah, as I said, I'm afraid collapse is looking awfully likely, but it's not bound to happen. If we're intelligent enough, if we move fast enough, if we throw ourselves into movements like Extinction Rebellion, if we transform consciousness, if we act, if we change institutions, I think it's still possible for us to avert collapse. But if we do avert collapse, we'll be doing it by moving swiftly, voluntarily, in the direction of a thoroughly relocalized society. It will look so different to what we've got that it will no longer in any meaningful sense be this civilization. So either this civilization is going to collapse or it's going to intelligently transform itself into something very different. I, I agree with that. And I, I see a lot in mainstream political discourse. As soon as you critique the current system, you get people that are just complete advocates for you know the free market and will go it's lifted more people out of poverty than any other system and i do say to that that is true up to now but it's caused a lot of problems and it's what's to say that because they, they always say we've tried every other system like communism and all that and it yeah. hasn't worked but i'm just like no but before capitalism you yeah. know that w- it had to start at some point. There are other yeah, systems, there, yeah, that, there are other systems that, that are working right now, yeah. you know, in indigenous cultures, in, uh, in peasant societies, the commons, we can learn from the past. We can look at what people are talking about in terms of the future, in terms of the commons vis-a-vis computers and information uh, technology. And in terms of the defense of the, the capitalist system and the free market so-called system that has lifted so many people out of poverty, well, I'd say two things. Firstly, I'd say that it's an equivocal truth because it's also caused so much poverty by forcing people to exist within a market system in which they are incredibly um, underprivileged. And when you create enormous, incalculable inequality in the way that our system has done, you cause people to have miserable lives. And in that sense, you cause poverty, you cause relative poverty. Relative poverty is the technical term for when people are way poorer uh, than other people. And and furthermore, and obviously this goes right into the conversation that we've been having having the whole time here how can a system be defended that is driving us straight over a cliff these people are just dinosaurs they don't understand what's coming or they don't want to understand what's coming uh, the people who govern us the uh, the 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 ceos the, the 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 big financiers and so on they're mostly just dinosaurs they are completely out of date some of them however especially actually in the business world some of them are starting to wake up and to realize we cannot go on like this. Either capitalism has to radically, radically reform itself or it will no longer exist. It it may be that it's unreformable. It may be that it's impossible to make capitalism work in in any form. What is certain is that the existing so-called free market system uh, is is finished. The future will be radically decentralized. As you said, it will probably involve a significantly different uh, monetary system, maybe uh, local currencies, um, maybe something which is is much much less like uh, money at all. But the, the bottom line is that those people who are saying, oh, the current system's done all this good stuff, Stuff, therefore, who are you to speak against it? The answer is you. Th- there are many answers, but the most crucial answer is you are driving us over a cliff. We refuse to go over that cliff with you. It's, it's, it's the issue I've always had with ideology. And, you know, people often talk about like religious ideology. For me, I don't actually have um, a vendetta against any specific ideology. Uh, well, obviously, I have critiques of individual ones, but for me, it's ideology as a whole of if you're just willing to stand by it and not critique it and yeah. you know capitalism is an ideology you know communism is an ideology yeah, right. for me and it's why i've always wondered where i sit politically in that because i'm always willing to have my mind changed and yeah um and, and i'm not a perfect person i well, have conformity bias and all that sort of yeah. stuff confirmation bias but i think what you're talking about is is true freedom of thought so I've often been critical in the past of the political philosophy of liberalism, very critical of most forms of libertarianism. I'm critical of them because of the way that they're driving us over a cliff. I'm critical of them because of the way that they're anti-community, uh, anti-friendship often, and so on and so forth. But where I'm totally on the side of, uh, of, the, of the battle cry of, uh, of freedom uh, is that we need to have true freedom of thought. Uh, and that is our aim, it seems to me, in philosophy, which is the subject that I uh, profess and where I've done you know, a lot of my publishing over the years. 
Uh, and I believe that, that 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 is, if you will, a sort of destiny for human beings to really be able to be self-critical, to really be able to reflect. And we desperately need that freedom of thought right now. Most people are, are still, to some extent, stuck in outdated ideas of individualism, growthism, uh, development, endless progress, so-called, uh, ideas of, uh, of capitalism as being um, unquestionable. All these ideas now have to be questioned. And if we're not willing to question them, we'll be thrown out of the gene pool. Yeah. And I, I and I'm not saying that you think this um, either, but um, I always like to make the disclaimer. Um, I don't think people are inher inherently bad people. I think they're people that yeah, have been no. reinforced by a system that if it serves them well, they'll keep perpetuating oh, yeah. it. And I think that a lot of the people in the current power structure, you know, we were talking about decentralization throughout this, the reason they want to uphold centralized power is because a lot of people have grown up in a world where success and prosperity is associated with wealth accumulation. And actually going back to what I mentioned earlier about um, ownership versus access. Um, and the concern I have is a lot of people in you know political power structures feel that we have to hold on to this and we just have to, because if we don't, that's going to collapse and it's going to be chaos. And so it's about how do we have an honest conversation about transitioning and democratizing power because technology has allowed people to become much more uh, independent in the way they get their information. Mm. Um, it's not just decentralized information, but in many ways wealth because of economic opportunity and at least being able to look afar. It's why people migrate all over the world now because they can look at another country and go, I actually like that quality of life. Um, and uh, I think that's at odds with the old way of thinking. And so yeah. kind of what you're saying about either we transition now or it's going to be forced upon us. Yeah. I think that's the same with the current system they're trying to uphold. Either they yeah. transition now or it's going to be and, taken and off. And I'm them. sympathetic to that. You know, yeah. That's what I was saying a while ago when I said, at the end of the day, there's a limit to how much, you, how much use you can do of kind of with naming and shaming, with... Uh, criticizing individuals with guilting uh with uh, with calling out um uh with um um uh, attacking um pe named people or even named corporations all of that there's a place for it and it's totally understandable and i've done it myself and i do some of it myself etc but at the end of the day where one of the places where i think extinction rebellion is showing leadership is in the thought that we are all part of uh, a toxic system and we must change this system together or ultimately we may go extinct together and i wonder if this might be a good point on which to to end miles because i'd love to i'd love to end with a statistic which i think is a, a real game changer i think if many more people knew this statistic wherever they are in this system wh whether they're a, a ceo or um a person living in a slum or whether they're you or me or anyone uh, in between anyone who hears this statistic will understand we must change the system we we must do do it together we must find a way of, of living together much more lightly on the earth much more much more equally and of building a future that can last and the statistic is is this that so imagine you're you're driving your car and it's it's running on petrol let's say you have a petrol car right um as many of us still do um and the, the petrol is burnt, uh, and it produces this fierce fire that powers the car, right? Uh, and, and that heat uh, th then dissipates. And we know that also in that petrol is carbon that gets liberated and goes up into the atmosphere. And what most people don't understand is just how serious the greenhouse effect is, how massive it is. So I want to ask you the question, what do you think is the ratio of the heat that gets produced from burning that petrol in your engine versus the heat that gets trapped in the atmosphere by the greenhouse gases that are emitted from, from that petrol. Do you think, and you can all, you know, as you're listening to this, you can all think if you don't already know the answer, and most people don't know the answer, you can all think to yourself, oh, well, is it, maybe it's about the same, or maybe, you know, the greenhouse effect is 10 times worse, maybe over the decades or centuries that that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere, maybe it traps 10 times as much heat as was produced by the intense heat in the, uh, in the car engine. Let me tell you the real figure. It's 60,000 times. <laughs> Right. Fossil fuels are weapons of mass self-destruction. And if we do not get off them together fast, they're going to kill us. 
So, you know, that is the bottom line, which I hope might bring us together and enable us to really understand that we can and must change this system fast. Well, uh, that's a very uh, poignant note to uh, end on. And I, I guess I would just put it out there for anyone who has been listening to this uh, and wants to get engaged. And obviously, I, I very much um, support um, the work that you've been doing and and much of what Extinction Rebellion does. Um, but for people that want to find out and, you know, obviously make up their own minds, where can they find out more about the organisation, how to get involved? Also, what your sort of, not manifesto, but what your program is? Mm, yeah, great question. So um, you can go to rebellion.earth. Uh, I'd also... And that's uh, a global... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I'd also urge people to follow um, XR on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and then there's resources, of course, in my stuff as well. You can look at my website, rupertreed.net, for example. Great. Um, I just want to thank you for stopping by and um, just being willing to have this long, free-flowing conversation. I've really enjoyed it and I've definitely taken a lot from it. Pleasure. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Cheers.